We discussed uh, the solution. Let me write again. X full is, remember, we are doing forced and damped oscillator. And, uh, well, we now consider times t much larger than td, which is 1 over beta. So this is gone. So the system is now uh, oscillating with the same frequency of the force. Force has the total control over the system. But the uh, response of the system comes with a phase difference and that we discussed also. Now we shall consider the ener energies. What's the energy of our oscillator? We again use this magical formula. Let me just remind you again. Uh, for the inhomogeneous solution, we have this is the solution. And we take the real, uh, real part of it. With x0 is magnitude times e to the i phi. And uh, velocity, which is the derivative, is uh, i omega x0 e to the i omega t, or v0, which is i omega x0 e to the i omega t. So this is the behavior of our system. This is the displacement, this is the velocity. Now we consider the energies. And of course, uh, we, uh, let's write the energy, um, x double dot plus kx is minus beta x dot plus f. I multiply by x dot. Uh, d by dt, one half m x dot square plus one half k x square is equal to minus m beta x dot square plus f x dot. <coughs> These are, since we are using uh, quadratic quantities, they, they must be real. And this is the energy. We see that uh, this uh, dissipates uh, energy, namely this is the uh, dissipated power, and this is the power input. And if you look at it instantaneously, this could be plus or minus. But uh, we are interested in the average uh, values of these things. And let me just uh, first consider e, the average of E. Well, the average of E is the average of kinetic energy plus the average of the potential energy. So let's just add them up. Ke. So we'll compute and add. And we, that, we use that magical uh, formula. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv square, 1 half m the physical square, we have to be real. But in the case of av average, only in the case of the average, we can use the uh, complex coefficients in terms of this harmonic uh, function. So it is 1 half m, 1 half the real part of v0, v0 star. This is constant v0. This is real. So it is 1 over 4 m v0 square. And uh, v0 is absolute square. So it's omega square x0 square. 1 over 4 m omega square x0 square. 
and we had obtained x0 square before. x0 square is f0 square over k square q0 square and the Lorentzian. So this is the uh, kinetic energy. Let's look at the potential energy. One half k x physical square. One half k, one half of real part of. We just look at the coefficient and its uh, complex conjugate. X zero square. So it is. 1 over 4, k is m omega 0 square, so m omega 0 square x 0 square. So I erase this part. I have 1 over m over 4, x0 square, omega square and omega 0 square. So I have e, I'm just adding those two, 1 over 4 m omega square plus omega 0 square x0 square. And x0 square is here. That's equal to 1 over 4. Well, uh, let us consider omega near omega zero. We don't have to do it, but uh, anyway, that's the most interesting case. Uh, M to omega zero square. This is F zero square over K square. Q zero square is omega zero square over beta square. And K square is m square omega 0 fourth times uh, the Lorentzian. So this omega 0 fourth cancels that. This m cancels this. This is 2. So it is equal to f 0 square over 2m beta square. 2m beta square L beta omega. This is E. Remember, this is the uh, Lorentzian. Okay? But now something is interesting here. Something is very interesting. We just erase this thing. Because we just uh, found that d by dt e is equal to minus power dissipated plus power input. But uh, we now see that uh, this is beta square. We now see that uh, there is no time dependence here. Therefore, this is zero. D, D, T, E is equal to zero. We are averaging over the cycle of the force, over the cycle of the harmonic force. So the average energy stored in the uh, oscillator is not changing. That means power dissipated, average power dissipated in a cycle is compensated by the average power input by the force. Therefore, that means PD is equal to power input. Although if you look at the power input instantaneously, it can be positive or negative, the, uh, its average over the cycle is uh, positive. Namely, you are giving energy to the system and the energy, the system is dissipating this energy. Okay, so let's compute then the power dissipated. Power dissipated. That's 
m beta x dot square, which is m beta vp square, which is beta two beta times one half m v p square. But uh, this is simply the uh, that's two beta times the kinetic energy average. And we just computed it, except perhaps uh, I erased it. Never mind, we can do it uh, quickly. Uh, one half m, one half real part of v0 square. That's m over 4 from here, omega square from here, x0 square. x0 square is f0 square over k square, which is m square omega 0 4 times omega 0 square over beta square. And for near omega, near omega 0, so we can cancel this. So it is 1 half, it is 2 beta, times e over 2. So, uh, power dissipated is beta times e. Incidentally, we have shown ke average is e over 2 and obviously then if kinetic energy is average is half the energy stored then the rest is must be the potential energy okay <clears throat> i'm raising this And since energy is, if you multiply this energy by uh, beta, we get uh, power dissipated. So power dissipated is beta E, if I multiply it is F0 square over 2M beta, this Lorentzian L beta omega. All right, I can, okay, let me rest. Now the power input, we don't need to uh, compute it because power input, power input average is PD. Nevertheless, it's a, uh, technically it's a good exercise to compute it. Power input average is F times B physical average. F was with their complex representations, F0 e to the i omega t, and uh, V is B0 e to the i omega t, or I omega x0 
e to the i omega t. So we can uh, take the average using the coefficients here. So it is one half the real part of coefficient of one and the uh, complex conjugate of the coefficient of the other minus i omega x0 star. And this x0 is x0 cosine phi, this time minus pi sine phi, because x0 is magnitude times e to the i phi. Its complex conjugate is e to the minus i phi, and we add them like this. So we have to take the real part. i is multiplying, so this doesn't contribute. Minus minus plus, i i is minus, so it is minus one half the real part. We already taken. This is omega f zero omega uh, x zero sine phi. This is the power input. Remember, we know the result. It's just uh, for the fun of it that we are uh, computing it. So we have to get this thing, x0 sine phi. So uh, x0 is x0 cosine phi plus i sine phi. Therefore, x0 sine phi is simply the imaginary part of x0, which is the imaginary part of, now we write the uh, Bright-Wigner uh, resonant form, which is something like that, minus f0 over 2m omega 0, 1 over omega minus omega 0 minus i beta over 2. We multiply by the complex conjugate, omega minus omega 0 plus i beta over 2. So that this is a square. I'm looking at the imaginary part, so it's i beta over 2. So let's turn it to a Lorentzian. So this is beta over 2 divided by beta over 2. So the imaginary part, this and that is the uh, Lorentzian. So this is minus f0 over 2m omega 0 times beta over 2 times uh, L beta omega. So 2 is cancelled. So we insert it here. That's equal to minus one half f zero omega. Again, I have an f zero with a minus sign from here. And omega zero beta l the Lorentzian. And uh, let us take the omega near omega zero. That's where all our Approximations are this is plus that's equal to f zero square over two m beta these cancelled times the Lorentzian. Let's check with the uh, dissipated power. Yes, they are the same. So we don't we did not need to calculate it, but it was just a, another play with this uh, resonant amplitude. All right, now uh, what's in order? Q value is energy stored within the cycle T divided by 
energy dissipated in one radian. So this is E average divided by energy dissipated in one uh, radian is 1 over 2 pi. Since 2 pi radians uh, make a cycle, uh, this is E dissipated in, uh, in the cycle. And that's equal to dt divided by t times t over 2 pi, t times power dissipated. Energy dissipated in one cycle is the length of the cycle times the power, energy per unit time dissipated on the average. All right, let's go on to do this again, t. So this is 2 pi over t times et divided by power dissipated t. But we have this uh, formula, power dissipated is beta times e. So this is equal to beta times e. So they cancel. 2 pi over t is omega. This is the frequency of the driving force, omega over beta. And since uh, we were considering uh, frequencies close to uh, the resonant frequency, we might just as well write omega 0 beta. So the, uh, it is the old, our old friend, uh, the quality factor of the uh, damped oscillator. But now uh, there is something interesting. The interesting thing is, is here, uh, the power dissipated or the power input has this Lorentzian uh, behavior. Okay? And let's re remember this of beta omega, that's beta square over 4 divided by omega minus omega 0 square plus beta square over 4. This is the Lorentzian, one, one half, and this width is delta W, which is uh, beta. So it is the width of the uh, re resonance. In fact, it's called full width at half maximum. Full width at half maximum. Full width at half maximum, okay? Now, obviously, beta times, now uh, there's a very interesting interpretation of this. Beta times one over beta is one, obviously. But beta is delta W, namely the bandwidth of our uh, resonance. So here I will write, Delta, uh, for beta delta W. And 1 over beta is uh, the damping time, Td. That's equal to 1. Now what does this say? Well, to excite the uh, resonator, our system oscillator, we have to come near omega zero within a uh, width of uh, beta. So if you are far away from it, if you are 10 betas away, uh, Lorentzian is here, you are not really exciting the system. So uh, to excite the system, uh, you need to uh, get in under this Lorentzian near omega zero. So this is a selectivity, namely, the oscillator is showing selectivity. If you are close to the resonance frequency, it is responding uh, to you. If you are far away, it's not responding. For example, there are many oscill oscillators. Uh, although we are uh, giving examples from mechanics, uh, think of the radio circuit. You are searching for a station and you want to tune in the right uh, frequency. If you are far from the frequency, you don't hear that uh, uh, radio sta station. 
So, uh, and you, uh, to be selective, you want to make it as uh, very selective. You want to make it as uh, uh, with as narrow as possible. But it says that you can make the narrow as, as small as possible, but there is a price to it. You, uh, you make the damping time uh, large. What does that mean, uh, damping time large? Remember the homogeneous solution? It goes like this, beta t over 2, which is e to the minus t over td, 2 td. So, uh, for times from zero to time td, you have these, uh, uh, shall we call it transients, the homogeneous solution is surviving, e to the minus beta t over 2, remember, and x in homogeneous. So, if you are interested in driving the system with your uh, 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 driving mechan mechanism, you don't want this inherent response of the system its own uh, frequency re response. You want, uh, like if you are, want to listen to a station, uh, you want to listen to that and not to the inherent resonance of your uh, radio circuit, for example. So you want to, uh, ideally, you want to uh, kill it as uh, soon as possible and get that. It says that this is impossible. So if you make it very selective, you have a very well, uh, long living uh, transient solution. If you want to make it uh, a very short uh, transient, then your delta W is big. So uh, when you are sweeping, perhaps you are getting many stations in. Is there an exact solution to this problem? No. Uh, you don't have a solution today. You won't have a solution one million years from now. It is the basic physics, physics of it that uh, if you want to design an, uh, something, you have to make a compromise between delta W and TD. All right, that's the quality factor. Now the uh, last thing, uh, since we took all these averages, let's look at the Correlation functions, which we can do hopefully quickly. I'm raising it. So uh, let's compute XPT, XPT plus delta. And remember, XP physical real we call x is equal to real part of x0 e to the i omega t. So it's nothing but the coefficients. This one has the coefficient 1 half real x0. The second one will have x0 star, but its time is not t but t plus delta. And I have e to the minus i omega. Uh, T, it's like omega zero, so it is x zero square over two, and I'm taking the real part, not T delta, cosine omega zero delta. So if I multiply by, uh, we erase those formulas. If I multiply by k, it's the, uh, if I multiply by k and divide by a k, this will be the average energy divided by k cosine omega zero delta. And this is the, uh, remember, this is the constant energy that's not changing in time. So that's the first one. 
the second one, VPT, VPT plus delta. That is one half real part of V0, V0 star e to the minus i omega 0 delta, which is one half V0 square cosine omega 0 delta. And if I multiply by m and divide by m, this is uh, E over M cosine omega zero delta. So all these functions are independent of time. And finally, let me give you as an exercise. Let me erase this one. Third one, the average of x, p, t, v, p, t plus delta. That's one half real part of x zero. This thing, v zero, e to the minus i omega zero delta. And this thing is i omega zero x zero star with a minus sum. I'm taking the complex conjugate. And this is cosine omega zero delta minus i sine omega zero delta. That's equal to Minus minus plus i i is minus. It is minus one half <sighs> omega zero x zero square sine omega zero delta. I can write this thing as x zero times omega zero x zero if you wish therefore this is one half x max v max I I went L beta omega times sine omega zero delta. So I did that uh, quickly because uh, x zero square has L in it. X max is when you evaluate it, when omega is equal to omega zero and L is equal to one. Uh, so x max square is F zero square K square Q zero square L beta omega zero, but this is just one. Okay? So this is the maximum uh, amplitude at the resonance. So we found the uh, Before I switch to, uh, I change the subject to discussion of videos, I want to uh, uh, look at these three oscillators that we studied, ideal, damped, and forced and damped. Uh, ideal had a constant energy, E equals E0. Kinetic energy average was equal to potential energy average was equal to E0 over 2. And uh, the correlation functions 
I will just on, write only one. Uh, x t x t plus delta was uh, average was e zero over k cosine omega zero delta. This was for the ideal. Damped e equals e zero e to the minus beta beta t. So energy is damped. Kinetic energy equals potential energy. That's equal to E over 2. Remember, this is decaying. E0 over 2, E to the minus beta T. And the uh, correlation functions, X, T, X, T plus delta is E0 e to the minus beta t over k cosine omega 0 delta. Forced and damped oscillators our latest case. Uh, I erase it. I did that. But uh, energy is constant. Kinetic energy is equal to potential energy. That's equal to E over 2. And the interesting thing is that uh, power dissipated, average power is power input. That's why the energy of the oscillator does not increase or decrease. Uh, and This had an interesting uh, relation to E. Uh, e was, there's an interesting relation between E and E is equal to PD. PD is, PD is beta E. We can uh, figure out where you to put beta because beta is one over time. So this is energy over time. This is energy over time. That checks. Okay. And the uh, uh, xt, this is after, uh, this discussion is after, uh, after the transient solution or the homogeneous solution is that uh, we simply have the solution, inhomogeneous solution, or the simply the solution due to the driving force. X t, x t plus delta, that's equal to E over k. It's very similar formula uh, again, like this. This time E over, over k cosine omega zero delta. Similarly for other correlation functions. So they have this uh, behavior. Now, uh, I want to say something about the videos. These are the videos of good oscillators. They are uh, from Professor Walter Levin's magnificent lectures. Uh, the first video uh, shows this. You have a high Q tuning fork. And uh, if you bring next to it another tuning fork, identical tuning fork, this is oscillating. This is not. But once you set it into oscillation, this will go and will start shaking the uh, second oscillator. So this will oscillate also. This is a high Q system, meaning high Q means omega zero, Q is omega zero over beta. That means uh, Q is high. Uh, so it's a good oscillator. So if you just put in the next uh, phase, if you uh, change the, so it has omega R, the, the same resonant frequency. This is omega r. This is omega r plus delta of w 
positive or negative, you put here a, a small mass, you change the resonant frequency, and this time it won't be able to excite it because it's a high Q. Uh, you are here at resonance or, or there, but if the resonance has shifted, the second one is not excited. That's one. Of course, uh, tuning forks by themselves don't make much of a sound uh, because uh, it's only a thin uh, a metal. Uh, to make it sound, uh, you have to put it on a sound box and sound box uh, will send these sound, sound waves. Just like the musical instruments. Guitar is not only a string, you have a sound box. Okay, so that's one uh, example of a high Q uh, uh, oscillation experiment. The other one is uh, with atoms. Atoms are, well, they are high Q oscillators and they have energy levels, quantized energy levels, and if you are at this energy, uh, to excite the atom to this level, you have to give the right uh, amount of energy. You cannot uh, give this much energy and excite this level or you cannot give this much energy and excite this level. We have to come in at the right uh, energy. So the experiment there is uh, you are sending a bunch of photons. Photon is the particles of light. They have different energies. So let's say uh, epsilon 1, epsilon 2. This is epsilon, epsilon 3, epsilon 4. So let's say this is epsilon, this difference. So if this, uh, and uh, he uses uh, sodium, sodium is, sodium 11 is, it is neon 10 core, which is a strongly bound uh, system. And then you have one electron. And this electron is easy to play with. Uh, so you excite this electron. So this comes to sodium. It excites the sodium to, so let this represent the excited sodium. These, uh, these photons go on their ways, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, epsilon 4. What happened to our photon with energy epsilon? It is absorbed on sodium and made an excited sodium. The point is that this excited sodium doesn't stay around very much. In fact, almost immediately it decays. So this sodium will decay and uh, will send a photon of energy epsilon. However, uh, this was a beam in that direction. When this sodium emits its photon of energy epsilon, it can go up, down, in this direction or in that direction, uh, almost none or very few in that direction. So if you are looking at the colors, these photon, let these photons have uh, colors in the optical range, you will not see this one. Instead of its color, you will see a black, black line. Okay. So if you are observing the spectra, uh, the color of the photons coming here, and if you observe that uh, particular black line, you can conclude that there was sodium there. In fact, this is the way uh, we understand the elements uh, in the atmospheres of the stars. The uh, light is coming, but the star has uh, gas here of various kinds. And if there's a particular element, and this uh, light excites it. And it's basically taken away from the beam that's coming to your eye. Then you begin to see these black lines, and these black lines are fingerprints of the atoms in those, uh, in the atmospheres of those uh, stars. This is the absorption spectra. Okay, so this is the re called the resonant absorption. So it's a very high Q uh, system. In fact, this tells us that this proves us that the uh, physics in the at the stars is just the same physics. Uh, on Earth. Namely, the same physics is operating everywhere in the universe. 
And uh, now you can watch the beautiful uh, demonstration by Professor Walter Levin. Thank you. So it is clear that systems respond strongly when they are exposed to their resonance frequency. We've seen that for pendulums. We've seen that for springs. We've seen it for a wine glass. And we've seen this now for an RLC circuit. So these systems at resonance absorb a large amount of energy per unit time out of the driver. I have here two tuning forks which have an extremely high Q. In my attempts to measure it, I concluded it's way larger than even a thousand. And they have exactly the same frequency, both 256 hertz. This one and this one. Both 256 hertz. That's the way they are designed. To a high degree of accuracy, to better than a fraction of one hertz. But the cues are so high that if you were to plot, if you drive these tuning forks and you were to plot here this average power as a function of omega, then you would get something like this. It means you have to drive it exactly at the right frequency, otherwise it will not go into resonance. Well, we know how to get this going. You just bang it. That means you dump a whole spectrum on it. It picks out the frequency that it likes. And now I'm going to show you something remarkable. When this one generates 256 pressure waves, this one feels those pressure waves. And it loves it. <laughs> because it's just at the right frequency. And so it starts to oscillate. And so when I stop this one, you will hear this one. And that's called resonance absorption. Let's do that first. Now you must understand that the sound waves go from here to there. Not much power reaches that point. So when I stop this one, you hear sound, but it's not overwhelming. So you have to be very quiet. And I can do the same by hitting this one, and then this one will start to resonate. Now, if the driving frequency is off by a fraction of a hertz, one hertz is enough, one hertz difference, because the Q is so high, then this system will not be able to get this one going. And I can make this frequency a little lower than 256 hertz by putting this weight on here. And we have measured the frequency at this loaded way. It's roughly 255 hertz. And you're somewhere here because it's so narrow. The resonance absorption peak is very sharp, by the way. This is power, because what reaches here is joules per second. That's what gets it going, energy per second. So it's really a power transfer. So now I have changed the frequency, and there we go. Nothing. So just change this by one hertz, and you hear nothing. So now you see, you get some respect for high Qs. If you want to get resonance absorption in a high Q system, you've got to be dead on that frequency. So if you, for instance, banged all the keys on the piano, and this one would be nearby, it would only start to resonate if some or one of those strings would, re would produce exactly the 256 hertz. Otherwise, it would not. It ignores everything, 
It's only sensitive to that resonance frequency. You probably in high school have learned a little bit about atomic physics. And you probably know that electrons have discrete energy levels in discrete orbits in atoms. And you can excite the atom. You can bring an electron in a higher orbit, discrete orbits, which cost you a discrete amount of energy. And when the atom recombines, when the electron falls back, you get that energy back, exactly the same amount that you had to put in. And that energy that you get back comes out most of the time in the form of what we call electromagnetic radiation. Now, I know that in 803 we're going to deal with electromagnetic radiation in the future, but it's enough for now that you know that light, infrared, UV, gamma rays, x-rays, all of that, radio emission, all of that is electromagnetic radiation. And so here, I have the energy level, energy increasing, and here is an electron in orbit. That's the energy of that electron. A higher energy state is when I bring this electron here. I cannot do anything in between. It's quantum mechanics says it's one or the other. And if this difference is delta E in energy, this E stands now for energy, then when the electron falls back from here to here, it emits electromagnetic radiation with this energy. But if I radiate onto this atom, electromagnetic radiation with exactly that energy, then this electron can go from here to there. And that is called resonance absorption. Now let us stick for now to visible light. The higher the energy, the bluer the light is. Or, as modern physicists would say, the higher the frequency. And the lower the energy, the redder the light, the lower the frequency. So our visible light that we can see with our eyes goes all the way from the red, low energy, to the violet, high energy. Let's go to the sun. But the sun radiates in the visible spectrum all the way from the red to the violet. But in the solar atmosphere are elements. And when these elements see just the right energy from that spectrum to which they are exposed, they love to take out of that spectrum just the right energy that gets them into an excited state, which is called resonance absorption. And so that energy is removed from the spectrum. So when you look at the solar spectrum, there are bands in the spectrum where the colors are missing. Absorption in the spectrum, dark bands in the spectrum. They were discovered in 1802 by William Wollaston. And in 1814, Fraunhofer had catalogued 475 of these lines and they are now referred to as Fraunhofer absorption lines. Even though they did not understand the physics, this is a quantum mechanics picture that came from Niels Bohr, 20th century, even though they did not understand what happened, they had noticed that these black lines in the solar spectrum coincided with emission lines in the spectrum that they can generate in the laboratory by heating up the various elements. And so without understanding why, they were able to say, ah, 
I see magnesium in the sun. I see aluminum in the sun, in the solar atmosphere. And so that opened a whole new industry of spectroscopy, which allowed astronomers to determine the chemical composition of the atmospheres of stars. And it was in 1868 that Joseph Lockyer found at least one dark line which did not coincide with any emission line in the laboratory. There was no element on Earth that he could say that must be the cause of that dark line. And so he called it helium, because the Greek word for sun is helios. So helium is an element that was first discovered on the sun before it was later found on Earth. I want to show you resonance absorption on the scale of an atom. And the way I'm going to do that, the setup is here, is as follows. We have a carbon arc, think of that as being the sun, which produces a spectrum, a beautiful continuous spectrum. I will show you that spectrum all the way from the red to the violet. And then we have here a burner, and we're going to put table salt here on a grid, which dissociates the table salt, gives me sodium gas, that's what I want, because sodium, when you heat it, can produce an emission line in the yellow. But if it can produce that emission line when the electron goes from here to there, it's the 11th electron, by the way, it's the most outer electron of sodium. 11 protons, 11 electrons. So if it can produce an emission line when it goes from here to here, it can also have resonance absorption, namely, when it sees that yellow line, the yellow the energy that corresponds with the yellow light, it sucks it up and it produces then a dark line. Because when it absorbs out of here this yellow line, it re-emits it almost immediately, but the re-emission will be in all directions, and so what is left over here is very little of that yellow. And so a dark line appears in the spectrum. And that then is an absorption line. It's power, what I'm going to show you, because light intensity, which I will show you there on that screen, is how many joules per second. So it is resonance, absorption of power. Now there is a catch. And the catch is that probably only you of here will be able to see it. And others could come down. You're going to see the spectrum here first of the sun, which is my carbon arc. Then I will put in the sodium, and you will see an unbelievable, unimaginable, beautiful, sharp line, like a razor in the yellow. But you've got to be close. So let's first, Marcos, if you manage to open the gas, he knows exactly where that gas valve is, then I will ignite it, we won't put it yet in the beam, okay, so we're going to make it completely dark, so here's, here are the salt crystals, and we're going to show you the spectrum there, we tried actually to make you see it here, on the TV, but it is, that didn't work out well, okay, so I'm going to turn on the, the sun. There is the sun. Okay, now we make it completely dark and I will give you a minute or so for your eyes to adjust. So you see your spectrum here and you see your spectrum there. How we do that is our problem. <laughs> and you will know how we do that in a month or so when you 
we'll learn about gratings. You will get a grading, actually, from us. There is a grating here, a wonderful piece of physics, which decomposes the light in colors, works way better than a prism, and you get one on the right side, and you get the mirror image on the left side. Look here, and let your eyes adjust. And then comes the moment of truth. I'm going to put in here now the sodium. Unbelievable. I see a line here. Sharp lies a razor blade. Can you see it, Nicole? Isn't it incredible? Come closer, all of you, come closer. Look at that line. <laughs> come on, come out of your seats. Look at that line, and I will move the sodium out. Now I move the sodium out. And now I move it in again. And there it is. There it is. You see that? Isn't that amazing? And now I move it out. And now I move it in. Isn't that a fantastic line? I can get it. Look at that. Look at that line. Look at that line. Resonance absorption of an extremely high Q system on an atomic scale. I hope you can sleep tonight.